What's interesting about this current case is that it looks like we're going to be jumping almost straight to a La Nina. So it will be five years in a row either being La Nina or El Nino if we do make that jump, which is uncommon. Welcome to Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. We're your hosts. Julie Bonk. And Tom Versman. Julie, excited to be here with you today. We got some fun stuff to talk about. Uh, weather is the overall topic, which is always interesting. But Julie, what do you what do you know so far about weather? And what are we going to dive into with our audience today? Yeah, so weather, what a topic. Uh, we're going to go through from the macro trends of like, what can we expect across the country? Like, what's the jet stream doing? Uh, but then we're also going to talk about when you're trying to forecast the next couple of days, what kind of tools you can use and what kind of trends that you could expect. And then you've also talked to me a little bit before we started recording about the La Nina and El Ninos. Can you jump into that a little bit? Yeah, so we're going to talk about how El Nino and La Nina will influence the patterns that we're going to see. As we all know, we're coming out of an El Nino year after three back-to-back La Ninas. So what can we expect next? Another El Nino, a La Nina, or the secret third one, the neutral pattern. So you had a great conversation with Zach Hansen. Can you shed some light on who he is and what he's doing for the Climate Corporation? Yeah, so Zach is kind of like the top weather guy at climate. And so he was able to explain a little bit more about what El Nino is and what it kind of looked like for the last couple of months. All right, let's check it out. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Zach Hansen. I lead the weather science team at Climate. We are the team that develops weather features, either for models that give recommendations for growers or for weather features that we want to put into field view that we think would be useful for growers as well. I know there's been a lot of talk about El Nino. I know that's a subject that we're going to touch on in this podcast El Nino pretty classically causes most of the northern U.S. to be warm. Um, And that has been what we've seen for all of October, November, December, and January. All of the the northern Midwest has been pretty toasty. There's been a couple cold snaps, but like relative to a normal winter, it's been a lot warmer than average. The opposite is a bit true for the southern U.S. It's less of a temperature signal there. But again, things are closer to average or even cooler than average in January for the southern U.S., um, the real signal there is that it's a lot of rain. Um, it's a lot more rainfall than t- is typical in the south, the south, and especially the southeast. Um, California, as of like February, has gotten a ton of rain, but that's sort of a, I don't know if I can attribute that to El Nino. That's just sort of something that we've been experiencing so far. Yeah, but what we know is that the El Nino kind of looks like it's coming to an end. And here's what Zach had to say about that. El Nino is basically this, temperature blob in the Pacific Ocean that extends from basically the coast off Peru all the way to Indonesia, kind of sits on the equator, a little bit south of the equator. And that temperature blob has oscillations. It's a El Nino Southern Oscillation. Warm blobs are El Nino, cold blobs are La Nina. The blob is like in the, the area of the Eastern Pacific, if you center yourself in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. When it's warm over there, it's an El Nino. Um, that changes the whole atmospheric circulation of the tropics. And that will like affect the weather in, in North America. We know that El Nino is coming to an end, or if it wasn't coming into an end, we'd also know that too, based on the temperatures of the ocean there. So we know it's warmer relative to the average temperatures, and we can measure that with buoys and with satellites and with a variety of other technologies. We do know that it is starting to come to an end. It will be degrading pretty rapidly over the next couple of months. We are still technically in an El Nino as of like end of February, early March. We're already on the decline, on like the downward trend where we are peaking in like early January, late December, starting to decline there. And maybe we're seeing a sense of that in the weather too. Like things are a little bit less overly warm in the upper US than they were before. But I think we're still seeing a pretty consistent El Nino signal for now. April's that month where scientists can really firm up their forecasts on whether or not it's going to be an El Nino or a La Nina or a neutral year. Well, hey, Julie, let's let's take a step back here for a minute. Before we talk about El Nino and La Nina, what I feel like, have we talked about that before on the show? Has Is there other details that we need to discuss? Do we have another expert out there? Yeah, so we actually did another episode, episode 51 with Brad Coleman. So he was the chief weather scientist before Zach Hansen, and he moved on from that position to become the president of the American Meteorological Society. Shout out to Brad on yeah. that. Congrats. Well, yeah, wow. what a title. What a title. We had a president here on the podcast. 
Anyways, so Brad walked us through a deep dive of what the different patterns look like for El Nino, La Nina. So here's Brad explaining that. It's taken the scientists about 100 years to figure it all out. It started when Sir Gilbert Walker from the UK, he was assigned to go to India and figure out why the Indian monsoon occasionally failed. So he went down there and did his homework, and, and we can return to that fascinating scientific investigation and story. But it really is all focused on the tropical Pacific Ocean. It helps to start with what is the sort of the pattern in, in ocean temperatures from the west coast of South America all the way westward across the dateline into Indonesia. And, and what typically we find on sort of the average pattern is that we have tropical trade winds, right? We've all heard of tropical trade winds, and they blow generally from east to west. So if you picture the large Pacific Ocean with this general pattern of winds blowing from east to west, so pushing the water towards Indonesia, what you end up doing is you pile up the warm water in the western tropical Pacific, and you bring up some cooler water in the eastern tropical Pacific. And, and that's the pattern. And so stands for an acronym for El Nino, Southern Oscillation. And it's kind of grabbing a couple pieces here. The Southern Oscillation is the label that Walker used, is this oscillation wavering of, of pressure. And, and he saw it in the pressure. He didn't know what was going on in the ocean. But we know it's the same thing reflected in two different sort of metrics. So he called it the Southern Oscillation. And, you know, gradually scientists spent more and more time trying to figure it out. And so something that he didn't go over there is that it's not just El Nino and La Nina. There's also a secret third thing. Third thing. Yeah, which is the neutral pattern. And we're not going to get into that very much today, but I always think it's kind of fun to talk about the secret third thing that's a little bit more common. I think you could take a stab at it. Yeah, so it, it's not as consistent as the other two patterns. It's not as you can't use it as a frame of reference to kind of predict what's going to happen as much as you can for an El Nino or a La Nina year. The good news, we're not in a neutral pattern. We're in a El Nino, probably transitioning into a La Nina. And so that gives us kind of a scorecard to work off of, of what we can expect for the next couple of months. Zach better watch out here. Future weather lead <laughs> in the house, possibly. It's like the Game of Thrones, That's but right. for the weather For side. the weather. Hey, Julie. Did you know we've had three back-to-back -back La Ninas? Yeah, but what's the difference between an El Nino and a La Nina? Well, let's turn that over to Brad and have him share with us. La Nina, what it really means is those trade winds are stronger. Ultimately, the atmosphere is working harder. It's pushing more the water farther and farther west and bringing up more and more cold water. So in the simplest term, that is, that's La Nina, is the warm waters in the Western Pacific and the water's colder throughout from the dateline all the way to South America is below normal. And in El Nino, what happens is those trade winds weaken. And now that sort of that big pool of really warm water in the Western tropical Pacific, that gradually flows eastward along the equator. And those temperatures go up. And now you exceed all the way east of the dateline. All of a sudden, the temperatures are into the lower 80s Fahrenheit. And so then they bring thunderstorms with them. And they're big, persistent thunderstorms. And again, that's the connection to our weather. So as we mentioned earlier, it looks like El Nino is going to come to an end. Really? So what's going to come next then? We put that question to Zach, and this is what he told us. What's interesting about this current case is that it looks like we're going to be jumping almost straight to a La Nina. So it will be five years in a row, either being La Nina or El Nino, if we do make that jump, which is uncommon. I would say, I don't think I'm aware, I wasn't looking too closely, but I don't think I've seen one where five years in a row we've had no into neutral. For most of the 2010s, we were actually into neutral. So there were like, I think four years that were not neutral and six years that were. And then the five years after that, we've been in either an El Nino or La Nina, which is pretty uncommon. Like into neutral happens around 40% of the time and then 30% for the other two. So it's a little more common than the others, but it's a bit weird to have it not happen. Zach mentioned that La Ninas are much more likely to be back-to-back -back than El Ninos are. He also mentioned to us, too, that El Ninos are actually stronger than La Ninas. And so when we're looking forward to the next couple of weeks of forecast, 
Here's what Zach said that we can anticipate with the end of the El Nino and the beginning of La Nina. El Nino probably will continue into April, is my, would be my guess, my interpretation. That means that we're going to have El Nino signals pretty classically through then. One signal is still like relatively warmer temperatures in the northern half of the country, um, and then relatively wetter conditions in the southern half of the country. And another signal is cooler temperatures in the southern half, but the El Nino is getting a little weak, and so it's hard to say that one for certain. Another signal is drier conditions in the northern half. But again, like the precipitation signals are trickier than the than the temperature signals, and so we can more confidently say the warmer in the upper Midwest. I was looking at the seasonal forecasts for the continental U.S. before this. There's a few of them. There's a European one. There's one from Columbia University. Unfortunately, it's pretty uncertain for almost the entire middle of the country. <laughs> um, I, I think that the rainfall signal, like especially like Louisiana, Arkansas, the eastern half of Texas, all the southeast, that's pretty strong. Like you're going to get more rainfall than is normal. Um, and then the, the warm signal in the upper Midwest was also pretty strong from what I was seeing. And then the middle half of the country essentially was like, it could go either way. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't mean that it's going to be average. Like it's predicting the chance of being above or below average. It doesn't tell you that it's definitely going to be average. So it'll probably be one or, or the other and not the average, but we just don't know which one yet. It's a bit tricky. I think other things to keep in mind are like snowpacks are a little bit down in like the upper half of the country. I, we just had ice off in Madison, so there is no more like consistent ice in the lakes of southern Wisconsin. Very early this year, one of the shortest ice ice years on record. Probably a signal that warmth is going to continue again. So maybe we'll have an early planting date. We've heard about El Nino and La Nina, but what about general forecasting? There, and there's a lot of tools out there for general forecasting, including the Climate Field View application where you can track your rainfall, past weather, hail alerts, everything from there. But what does he have to say about general forecasting? What's his advice? Zach gave us some recommendations for some tools that farmers can use for their short-term and their long-term planning. So I think the NOAA website is good for like, I think this week is the week where I'm going to plant. But yeah, getting into the field is pretty like, sensitive to soil moisture. Like if it's too muddy, you can't plant. If it's been raining a lot recently, you can't plant. If it's not going to be warm in the next few days after planting, that's a big problem, especially for corn. Like non-emergence is a, is a huge problem. So, okay, you've got your 8 to 14 day like sense of what it's going to be. Now you want to get a little more detailed into your forecasts. Noah, again, they have like weather.gov has a, a really good weather forecast. Fieldview has a weather forecast for this as well. If you want to get even more granular, and this is what I specifically use, I love this product. It's called the HRRR, H -R -R -R, the High Resolution Rapid Refresh, which is a US only super fine scaled weather forecast. It only goes out two to four days, depending on what hour it's made. They make one every hour. And I find that to be the, the most useful thing for like the, the short term. Like, I want to know what temperature is going to be at 3 p.m. on Saturday. So in a couple of days from now, that's what I would use to say, okay, I know it's going to be X temperature at this time. I want to know if it's going to rain at Saturday, two days from now. I would also use that just because it's such a fine scale. It basically models are only as good as like the data they take in. And a coarser model doesn't take in topography data very well. It has less information about the boundaries of the model. So the boundary conditions are coarser as well on a coarser model that are maybe global scale, but the HER is a super fine resolution model. So it takes in a lot more information and it doesn't try to forecast too far. So it's not going to get at risk of drifting off into craziness world. So I find that as like a, a really, really nice resource for, okay, I know this is the week. Now I want to choose the day and the hour or, or something. Um, the HER is what I go with. Weather is a moving target on a small scale, but even on a larger scale, once you understand all the pieces of the puzzle, you can really forecast and tell a good story and paint that picture of what weather is going to do. Yeah, and speaking of good stories and predictions, uh, you don't need to be a meteorologist to know that the sequel to Twister is going to be coming out this summer. And so we asked Zach if he had any plans for a viewing party for Twisters. I have not yet. I don't know what I'm going to do for Twister. I, of course, will go to the midnight showing. That's a given. Probably have to come up with a costume. In my PhD, when I was doing weather, I was a lightning scientist. So maybe I'll go as a lightning bolt 
as tornado related, but not quite a tornado. Maybe easier to make a costume for also. Um, I could like make a lab coat with lightning bolts on it or something. I don't know. Well, we know we've had an early spring, and there's been a lot of different things going on this year. We've had early planting in some areas, but I know a lot of folks right now are planting already. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And today we talked quite a bit about how we're moving out of an El Nino and into a La Nina and the kind of implications that can have when it comes to the weather across the country. That's right. And, and thanks, Brad and Zach, for continuing to educate us today and sharing your knowledge with everyone listening. This time of year, there's a lot of big equipment moving. So if you're out there in the field, stay safe. And if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to like and subscribe, share with a friend. And today's episode is sponsored by Climate Field View. We appreciate everyone tuning in and we'll see you around the farm.